Hey everyone, it's George Gross with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you're having a wonderful week, weekend, wherever you're at. And uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. I know that your time is very precious. As educators, uh, there's never a time where we're like, oh, what do I, you know, what am I going to do with all my extra time? So I know that you taking this time to listen, whether you're on a walk, just sitting, relaxing, watching this on YouTube. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time to learning with me. And um, I, I, I've really been thinking about uh, a lot about the conversations about learning that happen all the time in education. And there's these three types of learning that I'm going to talk about today that I talk about in an innovate side of the box that I think are really crucial to the work that we do. And we need to put more emphasis on these three types of learning um, in the role of educator. And so the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, learning for your kids, which obviously you're doing right now and all the opportunities that we have, um, but learning about your kids, who are they? Um, you know, what, what drives them, what, what their passions are, what their strengths are, how do we tap into that? And then learning with your students and how do we actually create spaces where we not only learn, um, our students learn from us as educators, but we learn from our students as well. And our students learn from one another. And I think that's really so important, especially with all the work that's happening in remote spaces, virtual learning, is that if I was actually a student and I wasn't going to school, I, I no offense to any educator, probably miss my friends most. That would be the hardest part for me is being away from my friends. And so, how do we create these spaces where we can have like meaningful um, connections and learning between our students so they can learn from each other. And I'll talk about each one of those uh, things just really briefly, but I, I wanted to share a story with you and kind of one of the reasons I believe those three things are so important. When I first became a teacher, I actually had trained to become a kindergarten teacher. And that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I've told this, and I've, it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of true. I was actually inspired by the movie Billy Madison. I just wanted to be that, you know, fun uh, teacher in the classroom. And just, I, I love being around kids. And I thought that, you know, elementary, especially at the lower grades, was something I really wanted to do. And it's something that I thought would bring me a ton of joy um, to do. And so I finished up my... Uh, university experience and I'd actually applied for a kindergarten position. It was really interesting because in the conversation and at the time I wasn't really into technology. It was something that we had to use at university my last year. We were actually forced to pay for a, a like a computer lab uh, certificate. And I was outraged by it because we had to pay $50 a year to have access to computers. I'm like, I don't even need that uh, because you know, computers, like, why do we need this? But um, I, I learned a little bit because I actually became, uh, I was a part of the student council and I actually took the only position that was available uh, at the time just so I could get on the student council was to create the website. So in this interview for this kindergarten position, it was really interesting because they kept asking me not about kindergarten, but about my experience with technology and the ability to make this website. And I'll tell you, like I did it a couple of times, had no clue what I was doing. And they just kept coming back to it, coming back to it, coming back to it, because they noticed it in my resume. So what happened was uh, I didn't get the job. I thought I had done really well in the interview. But a couple of weeks later, I called them for feedback. And I actually said, hey, like I'm new to the profession. I'm trying to get a job. And I think this is a, this is a, a really good thing for teaching candidates to do is, you know, if you don't get a position, ask like, hey, how could I actually improve in the work? It shows a willingness to learn for one. Um, but it also shows you're, you know, this is something that you're really passionate about and you want to get better at whether you're in that school or district or somewhere else. And so I had contacted um, the person interviewed me as the superintendent. I said, Hey, I'd love some feedback. And it was really interesting because said, actually, we thought you were a great interview and we loved everything you said, but we actually have this high school position teaching technology and we we're going to offer it to you today. So it was just luck that they reached out to, or that I reached out to them on the same day they were going to reach back out to me. So I went from being interviewed for a kindergarten teaching position and was offered a high school technology position, not knowing that much about technology. And I had contacted my student uh, supervisor at the time, or my, my mentor teacher who I worked with in my internship, and she said, take the job. 
it's so hard to get a job right now. I would take anything, get, get your foot in your door, foot in the door, and then prove that you're great at what you do. And so reluctantly I took the job and I was very nervous about it. So at the time, um, how the class had been set up because I had, I had entered in the middle of the year was there was these modules um, and it would actually, you know, different things. And so students would work at their own pace, do different things. Um, and we kind of do this together as a class. And I know a little bit, but not much more than the students. So what to prepare for this, what I would do is I would actually show up to class, uh, to school earlier, and I would actually learn the content right before. I, did, I didn't know how to teach it because I didn't know it. I had to learn it before. And so I'd learn this content probably about 30, 40 minutes before the students would show up. And then I would try to teach them. But because technology is so complex, and there's so many different things you can learn about any technology, I actually would be in class and I would say to my students, hey, I'm trying to do this. Does anyone know how to do that? And every single time the students say like, actually, I don't want to do this. Can I show you? And it was interesting because I think that from my perception as a student is that the teachers knew everything and that they, they were, you know, comfortable learning technology, you know, whatever they were teaching, they were the expert, right? And this is something I've always challenged in this notion. I, I think that I had expertise and I think that the majority of teachers in their subject area, and not always the case because sometimes you get, we have to teach subjects because, because someone has to teach a subject and no one else can at the time. So you're put in that position. I've never questioned that educators are not the expert in the classroom. I just believe they're not the sole source of knowledge. And I'm not talking Google and YouTube, even though those are things that we have amongst a plethora of other resources, but it's the students that we have in this classroom and in this space. Um, I was asking kids for help. I was asking them to show me stuff. And what was interesting and the perception of many is that somehow the students will look down upon you because you, you don't know everything. In fact, I found it was the opposite. I found the students respected and valued me a lot more because I actually had done the same thing for them. I knew they could help me out. I knew they could help each other out. And when my, the superintendent actually come to, to see me teach because they were thinking about next year and they wanted to see, am I capable of actually teaching for a full year, excuse me. <coughs> and so they saw me and I remember, and I was really proud of this. The feedback was amazing. And they said that it seemed like I had been teaching for a very long time that I got, that the students had respected me a, a ton and they were really, you know, we had a great relationship and connected. And I think it was be, I think solely is because of the value I put on their knowledge, their wisdom, their gifts they brought to their classroom every single day. And to be honest with you, I don't know if I would have been that way at the beginning of my career, if I wasn't actually in a subject area that I didn't know that much in, that if I was um, teaching something that I was very well versed in and, and felt I knew it inside out, that I don't, I don't know if I would have had that same attitude. And so a blessing was having that position, teaching something I wasn't really comfortable and I didn't know much about that I had to learn through the process. But the experience it taught me about how important it is that we create spaces, even when we are the most knowledgeable, uh, by far, we know the subject inside out, where we create spaces where we can learn from our students. And as I said, I'm going to talk about these three areas and the, the, why they're so important. And the, the learning for your students is what you're doing right now. And we do this so much in education. This is the default, right? We listen to podcasts. Um, there's so many opportunities to learn our, on our own. But we also attend conferences. You know, we do professional learning days with our staff. And it's almost a given that that's just what we do. And so I'm not going to really focus on this because it's what we know. It's what we do. But the learning about our students, I think, is something that we need to place more an emphasis on, especially with the idea of social emotional learning and, and why it's so crucial. And I think that if you look at schools, when, as students move up, as students move up through the grades, anything about a kindergarten student versus a grade 12 student, kindergarten student loves school. 
usually like, and of course, no generalizations. And, you know, as we get into grade 12, there seems to be less of an interest. And why is that? And I don't know if this is the exact reason, but I feel that a lot of times the higher students go up in school, the, le the less we focus on the relationship in too many cases. Uh, so for example, if I teach grade two, I'm probably with my kids pretty much all day, right? Might, they might go to phys ed with some other teacher or music or art or something, but the majority of the time I'm with them. But then we get to middle school and then we start, you know, having spe specific subject areas we teach and we might see, you know, 200 kids instead of the same 20, 25, 30 that we have all day and then go to high school and it's, you know, even more students, right? More subject specific. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that middle school teachers and high school teachers uh, don't care about kids. It's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying it's actually the structure of the way that we do our work in education makes it harder for those relationships um, to connect, right? And I've taught K to 12. And as an elementary teacher, I knew all my kids' names in my class within the first hour. And, you know, obviously you'd slip up and mess up names here and there, but high school is a lot harder. I still did it and it took me a lot longer, but I still went on my way to make sure that I knew every kid's name, could address them that way, knew stuff about them. And although it's harder to build relationships as you go up um, in education, it, it's, it's no less important. And you think about the universe experience even higher. There's a lot of times I was, one student of 500 and how I found out my marks was not by talking to my teacher or getting feedback. I'd go look and it wasn't even my name. It was a number of what my mark was. And, you know, obviously kids can do that online, but there's a, there's this disconnect. And I think that when we talk about learning about your students, it is building that relationship. And a lot of times when people talk about relationships, it's this idea that, you know, we're super friends and like, we just get along so well. But I think when I talk about relationships, it's really knowing who our kids are and, and how they thrive. So let's say I have a student who is kind of an introvert, doesn't like talking that much, right? Me constantly trying to get them to talk is actually not knowing the student, but me kind of understanding, you know, hey, this is a way this student actually thrives in this scenario and how do we bring that out? And if you think about, um, and this is an outdated practice, but we used to get lose marks for not talking enough in class. And so let's say you're an introvert, you don't like talking, and then you're punished for it because you're expected to, to conform to a certain personality type. That was literally a practice that was used when I went to school. And I'll be honest, I used when I first started teaching because that's what I thought teachers did because that's what I learned as a student. And that's not really a beneficial way to bring on the students. And so learning about your students is, you know, what does that relationship look like with each individual? And like I said, I know it's harder at the higher levels, no less important, but it's very crucial to understand. And so the last one is, which I touched on at the beginning of this is learning with your students. We need to create these spaces where we value the expertise of our kids, that they bring in different talents, different abilities every single time um, in our classrooms. And when we move to kind of this emergency remote teaching situation, you know, online learning, it was a challenge uh, for many. And to actually not just lecture and do this because there is a physical distance that we don't have and it's harder to connect um, in a virtual space than it is face to face. And one of the things, because of my work, because I keynote events, I used to, I don't know if that's ever happening again. I just feel like we're never going to have face-to-face -face events. I hope we do sooner than later. But um, when you keynote a conference, there is this kind of stand at the front and, you know, people listening. And there's, I, I actually think I'm not against lecture. And obviously, why would I be a lecture? I think good lecture is really powerful. But that's not necessarily a time that we connect. And so when I moved to like a virtual remote setting, I started kind of being the keynote in the sessions. 
And, you know, it's kind of like, hey, let's just sit back at a computer by myself and, and listen. And, I, and as I started doing it more, I'm like, that's that I'm taking this, this keynote setting that I'm doing, um, you know, in uh, a face-to-face -face setting, which I think has benefits. And I'm just trying to put it into a remote setting. But the beauty of it, it's really hard to stand up on a stage while people are talking. But it's not that hard to kind of throw out a question and get people chatting while you're sharing. Now, they might not be fully immersed in what you're sharing, but is the focus, is the focus on in our classrooms, you need to listen to me or you need to learn? Because those aren't always the same thing. So if I create a space where I throw out a question, I'm sharing some ideas, and students are actually maybe not focused on me, but they're focused on this really great conversation that they're having that's pushing their learning. Yeah, they might not be listening to me, but they might be learning, which is the whole goal of the work that we do is creating the spaces. Yeah, of course, I want to share content um, that people learn from me, and I'm going to find those times where it's like, you know, you're sharing your expertise. But it's okay having the space. And um, I think about that too in the work that we do. The when you actually have students understanding they can learn from each other, not only does it teach them to value one another and to value the abilities and expertise of, of each other, it also teaches them that those skills later and that, hey, it's, it's not just one person that brings the knowledge to this room. It's several of us and we all share and learn different ways. And so, yes, it's going to be helpful to the content now, but it's going to be beneficial to basically humanity after is that we learn to teach that in these spaces, we all can learn from one another. So those three types of learning, I'll just kind of go over them real quickly again, is learning for our students, which thank you for listening to this whole podcast. If you made it this far, I appreciate you. Uh, learning about our students, who they are, how do we build relationships? How do we bring out the best in them? And how do we know where they excel and maybe where they struggle and tap into that and really knowing who they are and what experiences they bring to the classroom and then learning with your students. How do we create these spaces where it's not just about them learning from the teacher, but we learn from one another and the teacher can learn from the students as well, as I shared with you in that story. So thank you for learning with me today. I would love to hear your comments. Please share it on the hashtag innovators mindset, either on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, but thanks for listening, and uh, I look forward to chatting with you again. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.